Stephen Kane, author of the book Planetary Habitability, is a professor of planetary astrophysics at the University of California, Riverside. He specializes in exoplanetary science and planetary habitability. He grew up in Outback, Australia, where his view of the night sky and fascination with solar system exploration motivated his actual career path. He received his Bachelor of Science with Honours from Macquarie University in Sydney and his doctorate from the University of Tasmania. His work covers a broad range of topics related to planetary astrophysics. He has discovered and co-discovered hundreds of planets orbiting other stars. He's a leading expert on the topic of planetary habitability, the habitable zone of planetary systems, and the study of why Venus and Earth underwent divergent evolutions. He's a prominent scientific leader for several NASA missions designed to search for life in the universe. He has published hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers, as well as several books on the topic of exoplanets and habitability. He is also a prolific advocate of interdisciplinary science through the combination of biology, climate science, geophysics, planetary science, and stellar astrophysics. Stephen, how would you describe your research interest? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so my research is very diverse because I study planets both inside and outside of our solar system, which sound like they should be intrinsically related to each other, and they are. But the study of these objects has essentially come from two different directions. And to explain that, I would need to go back a step to explain how I got here, because I started studying exoplanets in about 1996, uh, when the field of exoplanets was really just starting in in the sense of growing rapidly. Uh, prior to that, my main interest was planets in our solar system, and that's what I intended to do. Uh, but uh, as we were discovering planets around other stars, uh, we were finding mostly planets that are giant, like Jupiter. Uh, but during the 2000s, we started to find planets that are smaller and smaller and may even be rocky, like Earth. Uh, so in 2009, the NASA Kepler mission was launched, and that really uh, took a deep dive into the realm of terrestrial planets. Uh, and that was using something called the transit method, which measures the size of planets. And I was thinking at that time that, well, that means we can't really tell the difference between Earth and Venus because they're the same size. Uh, we need to understand from our own solar system how these differences work and how these planets evolve with time. And so at that point, around 2010, I started to go back to planetary science and solar system science and was thinking a lot more about habitability, the habitable zone, what are all the various factors that make a planet habitable. And so now, uh, getting up to the present time, uh, I, I'm working on all of these things. I, I work on uh, detecting exoplanets, studying their atmospheres, studying their orbital dynamics, how they gravitationally interact with each other. But I also study objects in our solar system and most particularly Venus. And I think Venus and Earth uh, as twin planets are uh, really the key to, to understanding how planetary habitability and how the evolution of surface uh, conditions of a planet change with time and what can that can teach us about Earth's future and uh, about the search for life elsewhere in the universe. Why did you decide to write the book, Planetary Habitability? Well, uh, honestly, the answer is I, I didn't. <laughs> what I mean by that is that back in 2017, I was approached by IOP Publishing to write a book on planetary habitability. And at that point, I had... Uh, written numerous books before in the sense that I had contributed chapters to books. Uh, there are numerous uh, uh, compilation books where people of different expertises will uh, write a chapter of a book. And at that point, I just finished writing a chapter for another 
uh, IOP uh, ebook about the Kepler mission uh, that was uh, edited by Steve Howe. And then uh, when I was asked to write a book by, by myself about planetary habitability, I just wasn't sure if that was something that I wanted to do. And, and the reason if, for that primarily was because planetary habitability is a vast topic and uh, and it's also a rapidly evolving topic. The discovery of planets around other stars uh, is is something which is always escalating. And the, we're always seem to be on the precipice of a new mission with new data that will give new insights. And so uh, I was wondering about the uh, the value in writing a book that I felt would be immediately out of date as soon as it's published. But later that year in 2017, I attended a, a planetary habitability conference and several of my colleagues they um i was i was going to say pressured that sounds harsher than i intended to. <laughs> they they advised me that that it would actually be extremely useful that all of these complications of planetary habitability actually makes a make a really valuable resource for the community to help resolve this as a, a, an issue for the community to get behind and so I decided, uh, I, I guess it was in 2018, to to write the book um, and in a way that it was interdisciplinary enough that it would be a great entry point for people from multiple backgrounds uh, to, to learn about the topic. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, this is where it it gets a little bit embarrassing because, uh, as I mentioned, I agreed in 2018 to write the book. And one of the interesting things about writing a book, as opposed to, say, writing a paper or, or, or some other thing, which is both far more compact and it usually has uh, a more strict schedule associated with it, particularly if you're working with co-authors, uh, a, a book is... Uh, very much something that is self-motivated. And I had worked, as I mentioned, with other cases uh, where I was contributing a, a chapter to a book or as the editor of a book where people were contributing chapters. And the, the people who lead those kinds of cases have an incredible cat herding exercise ahead of them because when people agree to write a chapter for a book, uh, it tends to fall down to the lowest priority on many people's list. And so uh, in just about every instance I, where I've been involved in a collaborative effort in a book, there's always an effort of trying to <laughs> almost bully some of the authors to fulfill their promises. And these books uh, usually end up being late as, as a result is there's a couple of authors who are hold out to you just trying to get them to write the chapter that they promised. Um, so when it comes to a single author book like this one, uh, there is nobody who's trying to herd me or trying to bully me into completing the work except for myself. And so it really did need to be uh, self-motivated and when you're a professor and you're trying to balance you, the the mentoring of your research group and your various research activities and attending meetings and teaching classes, once again, it can be something which can fall by the wayside. And the way in which I justified it to myself that the book was falling behind schedule was, as I mentioned earlier, that we always seem to be on the precipice of new and great discoveries. And so, uh, Early in 2018, for example, the uh, the NASA uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, TESS, was launched, and I attended the launch at Cape Canaveral. And I recognized at the time, wow, this mission is going to discover a whole lot of new planets, many of which are going to be very interesting case studies for the topic of planetary habitability. And so I should wait to see the results of that before I uh, go f too far down that down that line. Um, but what it really took, honestly, 
was the 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 pandemic because the pandemic of course um uh, all of us were at home and it gave me time for introspection on what i wanted the book to be and and how i wanted it to contribute to the story arc of planetary habitability being told within the community and uh so it was during the pandemic really that i was able to focus and uh, and also motivate myself to to get it all completed and so it wasn't until the end of 2021 i would say i as i recall it was about uh september october of 2021 uh that i sent the final manuscript to uh to uh iop and uh, that was after i'd had several colleagues who looked over it because i didn't want to send them a a book that may have errors i really wanted to get this right and so fortunately i had several colleagues who were able to devote the time to send me a lot of feedback which they did and i was able to correct that and so uh that sounds like end to end that it, look, because I, I mentioned at the end of 2017 that I had had the original offer, and then 2021 was when the manuscript went in. That is four years, <laughs> but that is not four years of continuous effort. It was really in that last uh, 18 to 24 months that uh, I was able to devote the time needed to do the book justice. So you already mentioned some of them in the previous question, but what are the pros and cons of writing as a single author as opposed to a compilation of authors? Well, yeah, there, there are a few pros and cons to this. Um, one of the pros to having a compilation is, of course, you're able to draw upon a vast uh, resource of expertise for the particular topic. Uh, it's It's hard for somebody to be uh, an expert at everything and to do the individual topics justice. And this is particularly true of something like planetary habitability because it does cover a very broad uh, spectrum of topics. Um, and the 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 downside of the compilation of of authors, there are there are several downsides that in, in my experience come through, uh, one of which is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're limited to the schedule of the individuals who are involved in that project. And uh, as is often the case in these situations, you only go as fast as the slowest person. Uh, so you'll always have some authors who are very quick and prompt and motivated in getting their chapters done, whereas you'll have others who are at the opposite end of that. So. Um, the other uh, problem with having different authors is that they may not necessarily, and usually don't, uh, collaborate very strongly on what's going to be in their individual chapters. And so it's very difficult to get consistency within a single volume, both in terms of the narrative of the topics that are being discussed, the nomenclature that's been used, uh, across all the individual chapters. You may have variables that just change from chapter to chapter uh, and and repetition, of course, as well. And so you can end up with a very inconsistent narrative as well as style uh, in the way in which the book has been written. And so that was a, a, a huge advantage I found in writing the book as a single author is that I was able to plan the whole book out from end to end in a, a in a narrative that made sense, where uh, one chapter seamlessly led into the next, and that throughout the book, I was always uh, conscious of what the individual chapters were contributing and constantly referring to them. As seen in chapter so and so, you could re refer to something about, say, the stellar astrophysics, and then come back to that later on because you know that you've already discussed it. And using a single style, uh, I, I think, helped the narrative be much smoother throughout the book. 
So uh, overall, this is something that uh, I found from my, my own experience. I, I very much appreciate the volumes where chapters have been contributed by various authors. Uh, but uh, overall, from my own work, I prefer books that are written by a single author because of that consistency in narrative and nomenclature and all of those pieces that that need to come together. Uh, so those are some of the pros and cons that I found for sure. Great, thank you. Who is the intended audience for your book, Planetary Habitability? Yeah, this is something I, I thought a lot about because when I was first asked to write this book, not only was I unsure about uh, the value of a book in, in the context of where we were at uh, in terms of the science and what new discoveries might be coming if this was the right time and so on. Um, but I was also conscious of the fact that there had been other books that were uh, re at least related to that topic. There hadn't been any books specifically called Planetary Habitability, but there were certainly books that had... Um, contributed to that topic, uh, books which I, I value very much. Um, uh, there's uh, th there's a, a book by uh, David Catling and Jim Casting, for example. I, I'm, I'm blanking on that. It's a very long-winded book, but it's, it, it's, it's about atmospheres on, on terrestrial and lifeless world. It has a very long title. And there's another one by uh, Ray Pierre Humbert on, on planetary climates that I use quite a lot. Um, it, so these books are, are, are great, and I, I felt that they had contributed a lot to this discussion. Uh, but those are written at a quite advanced level. And for people usually from a fairly specific, be it planetary science or climate science, atmospheric science background. Um, and so one of the motivating pieces for this is that I teach a graduate class on planetary habitability. That's the name of the class. And I am in an Earth and Planetary Sciences department, which means that within this graduate class, I have people from a, a variety of backgrounds. I have students that have a background in astronomy or geophysics or even biology. Uh, and I designed that class to be an entry point for all of these different backgrounds and disciplines to describe what the main questions are for planetary habitability and pathways to investigating them. And, and so we certainly are rigorous, uh, particularly in the exercises that we run within that class but it was really designed to keep everybody funneled into the same endpoint where we understand what the what the basic processes are that are defining planetary habitability. Uh, and so I wrote the book in the same way in that I wanted this to be an accessible book uh, that was more for this interdisciplinary audience. Uh, and, and so feel that niche that was needed uh, where people from a variety of backgrounds could could pick it up. And so in terms of the audience, uh, I, I would say it's, it's, it's for anybody, really. Uh, but as is really broadly, um, uh, I, I would say it's um, mostly had the students in my graduate class in mind. Uh, so although there, there are a huge variety of people who could pick it up and read it and and learn from it, uh, it's it's mostly for uh, people, whether they be at any career level and they want to apply their expertise to the topic of planetary habitability. But I, would, uh, but I was mostly thinking about my graduate students when I wrote the book. And now to the big question, what is planetary habitability? Oh, that is an incredibly tough question. And this is something I devote the first two chapters of, of the of the book to uh, really about, you know, what is planetary habitability? Why does it matter? Uh, how do we start putting these pieces together? And planetary habitability 
uh, is a controversial topic, which incidentally is another reason why I had some hesitancy initially in agreeing to write the book because it is a, a controversial topic. Um, and, so, and a lot of that uh, I had argued over the years was just from a misunderstanding or miscommunication of what planetary habitability can mean in different contexts. And by context, I mean, uh, if you have people from different disciplines uh, talking about planetary habitability, then they can be talking about very different things. So for example, if you're talking to an ecologist, then the ecologist might be looking at very earth-based models on what are the conditions in which uh, different forms of life can uh, maintain survival within that environment. Whereas if you're talking to an astronomer who are all about, like they're at the opposite end of the distance scale, so to speak, and um, th they are interested in remote sensing of atmospheres, uh, the very top of the atmosphere usually, which may indicate a temperature uh, pressure profile of the planet that can be used to infer surface conditions. And so the, there's very different approaches to this. And so, uh, as I said, it, it gave me some hesitancy because it is controversial. Uh, part of the reason it is controversial as well is because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, back in 2009, the Kepler mission was launched and that started to discover a lot of terrestrial planets. And this was quite new for much of the astronomy community. And so there were publications that happened uh, during that time, and even before Kepler launched, um, this was an issue, where astronomers were finding planets which they assumed to be terrestrial, and they were able to place them in the calculated habitable zone of the star and then they would make a press release saying that we've discovered a habitable planet. Uh, there's a vast information gap between finding a planet of a certain size that lies within the habitable zone of its star and inferring that the planet is indeed habitable. A vast information gap. And much of the community, and when I say community, I mean the broad scientific community, including biologists and planetary scientists, uh, they understood this. And so they would see these press releases and have an extremely negative reaction. They would say, there's no way we can tell if that planet is habitable, all that we currently know that that planet is habitable. And they were absolutely right in saying that. And so that's what led to a lot of the controversy. So like I said, that was a hesitancy. But then I realized that that was probably reason why I should write the book <laughs> to confront this controversy and to help resolve this this issue. So like I said, I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the book discussing this about what is planetary habitability. And so the uh, the way in which I define it in my book is uh, planetary habitability, I r loosely define it as the temperatures at the surface that and and pressures that enable surface liquid water and i spend a lot of time discussing why surface liquid water is so important for planetary habitability in the history of life on earth but the reason that i define it that way is because if you define it that way that means that you are creating a a, a science problem which encapsulates physics, geology, atmospheric science, and so on, in which you the, are required to uh, identify all of the various factors that will stop a planetary surface from being in the temperature range of zero to 100 degrees Celsius. That allows you to parameterize the problem. And so that's what I found the most useful uh, because then you can start to talk to specifically to all of the various uh, uh, factors, which you can also parameterize in how they're influencing the top of the atmosphere of the planet or the surface or uh, various other features that contribute to the energy balance 
of the planetary atmosphere that is controlling this temperature range. And so that's the way I define it uh, in, in my book, because as I said, that enables a conversation going forward where you are able to look at each specific factor and calculate how that is contributing. Could you describe how you structure your book? Yeah, uh, so in, in order to break this down into the various factors, uh, there, are, there are three main areas that I, I looked at, and then there were various pieces that came off of that. Uh, because there's three main areas uh, that influence the energy balance at the surface of a planet. Uh, and one of those is the star. And so I, I, I devoted a whole chapter. Uh, I, I think I called it nature's fusion reactors. And uh, I devoted a whole chapter to stars uh, because the energy received by a planet from the star is overwhelmingly the major contributor to the energy balance. And, uh, and and there are all different kinds of stars that have all different kinds of effects. And so I I wanted to start there. We're, we're talking about the, 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 the stars. After that, I, I spoke about uh, another issue, which is, of course, the properties of the planet itself. What is the composition of the planet? What is its atmosphere made out of? How is the atmosphere structured? And uh, how does the planet change through time? Which, by the way, is a whole theme of the book, which is the, uh, the axis of time. If we look at a planet at a particular time in its history and say, for example, we, uh, we look at a planet around another star and we infer that it has a CO2 rich Venus like atmosphere, uh, then we would conclude probably correctly that that planet is not habitable. But what if I told you that that star and therefore the planet are 8 billion years old? Then all you might be saying is that all planets turn into Venus because there could, could have been a period of its history when it was just like Earth. And so it's very important to consider how planets change with time. When we look at the, some, the way I word it sometimes is that if you only look at the solar system as it is today, then you are ignoring almost everything the solar system has to teach us because the solar system as we see it now has changed dramatically. The way I heard a colleague mention it recently is that Earth two billion years ago was not an Earth-like planet. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. And so I talk a lot about that. Uh, and the third main, main area is the system overall. Are there other planets in the system? And if there are other planets in the system, like a giant planet like Jupiter, then how is that changing the orbits of the planets? How is that contributing to the distribution of material within the system. Those are important aspects as well. And so I spent a lot of time on those three main areas, the star, the planet, and the planetary system. And then I spoke to other features such as um, looking more deeply into the topic of the habitable zone, which is once again, a very misunderstood topic and the source of much controversy. There's a lot of people who dislike the concept of the habitable zone, once again, because it's misunderstood, because the name implies the zone in which things are habitable, but that is not what the habitable zone means. Counterintuitively, and there's a lot of people who's, who have uh, uh, probably correctly argued that the, that the name is very misleading and should be changed, and maybe that's true. Um, but it's actually really more of a target selection tool based on Earth. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time talking about the habitable zone, what it really means, how we calculate it, and apply that to a few other planetary systems. I spend a lot of time talking about the solar system towards the end uh, and what we learn specifically from each object within the solar system. Of course, we always think of Earth. We Yes, we learn a lot about the Earth. Certainly, Earth is our only example so far that we know of, of a habitable planet. But we learn things from everything else, 
particularly as I've mentioned Venus, because Venus is is another. We're very fortunate in the solar system to have a twin planet. You know, to have a planet that's the same size but had a very different outcome, because that shows us that the size of the planet is not necessarily an indicator of of its evolution and whether it will turn out to be habitable. So things like Venus, and on the other hand, Mars, which is half the size of Earth, are showing us where the boundaries of habitability might lie. And that's extremely important to understand where the boundaries are. But even things like Mercury and, and Moon are telling us about the crater history and the impact history of objects within the solar system. The giant planets are incredibly important, particularly Jupiter, as I mentioned, which is more massive than all the other planets combined. And uh, and so it has had a profound effect on the sculpting of the solar system and the evolution of the orbits through time. So I spent a lot of time on the solar system and what we learn from that. And then uh, I move into the pathway forward. What's what's coming up next? And that that is really an opportunity for me to be speculative, but also to uh, talk to specific programs that and recommendations from the decadal surveys, which came out recently, about what what their suggestions are about the pathway forward, what missions have been recommended, and how we might fully take advantage of these in an interdisciplinary way, which is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a main theme of the book, that this really requires uh, people from all different backgrounds working together. It's not enough, clearly that an astronomer who knows nothing about planets um, find uh, evidence that there is an object that usually we can't see uh, orbiting another star that that may be planetary uh, in nature uh, and calculate it in the Hubble zone and declare that it's habitable. That is clearly uh, not a pathway to the truth. <laughs> well, it's part of a pathway. It's not the complete pathway. And so that's what I really talk about at the end about how all these pieces need to come together and how different disciplines need to be looking at each other. Like, for example, how the exoplanet community needs to look at planetary science missions, missions to the icy moons uh, and to Mars and to Venus and to all these different locations in the solar system. And they need to be looking at those and really considering them as exoplanet missions in the sense that they contribute to the overall narrative of the planetary habitability story. So that's how I structured the book. And as I mentioned, it, it was um, based largely upon the structure of my graduate class, which I've been teaching for several years. On that note, would you consider updating your book and maybe writing a second edition? So, Yes, this, this is a funny th one of those funny things of um, uh, there, there's an old quote that uh, which is made in reference to TV shows and movies, I think, but it generally applies to all forms of art, whether it be writing or otherwise, that um, that works are never completed. They're merely abandoned. Uh, and I certainly felt that for myself when I when, when I wrote my book, the moment the book was uh, accepted by IOP and I had completed the proofs and it was on the track to becoming real. The moment that happened, I thought to myself, I could have done that far better. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, uh, I, I, if I, if I could do it again, I would have written more about this topic. I would have improved that. And of course, as I said, at the very beginning, this is such a dynamic field that I, I knew going into this, that it would be out of date as soon as it was uh, produced. Because, uh, for example, uh, right on the tail of my book being published, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched. And that's already been te uh, teaching us incredible things about planetary atmospheres, most particularly for the TRAPPIST-1 system. And so, uh, yes, I, 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 this is a book that almost demands a, an update. And and so um, I had thought when the book was published, uh, which was early in 22 or late 21, early 22, when it came out, uh, that then there might be a, a five year time scale. And so now we're in 23. So um, 
uh, maybe a, a, a couple of years from now, I think would be the right time because at that point, then we would have had several years of, of James Webb uh, data on exoplanets uh, and all the lessons that come from that uh, and progress that has occurred in other areas about the frequency of different kinds of planets. There's a lot of uh, new material I, I would love to put into the book as well as expanding on some of the topics that uh, that I already addressed in there. So, yeah, like I said, it's uh, I feel like a second edition of this book is an in inevitability. Oh, great. Thank you so much for being with us today, Stephen. Thank you. It's a pleasure.